Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to um, tonight's ASIC member meeting. Uh, for those of you who are regular joiners of this meeting, um, you might be aware that, you know, the last few meetings that we've had, we have been talking about different technologies which can help uh, with um, wildlife surveys. And we've talked about infrared camera surveys and how they can help with otters. And um, also more recently about how technologies such as robots can help. But tonight we're mixing it up and we're going to um, enter into a whole different area, which is um, COVID-19 and animals. And we're very excited to have Dr. Rachel Tarlington join us. She is going to be our main presenter tonight. She's an Associate Professor of Veterinary Cellular Microbiology at the University of Nottingham and a European diplomat in veterinary microbiology. Her research expertise is in animal virology um, and in particular retroviruses. And she's actually studied um, koalas out in Australia, which is something very close to my heart. But she, her research also covers a broad range of virology and other genetics methods. So um, hopefully we'll hear a little bit more about that tonight. But I'm really looking forward to hearing about her current research um, project on COVID-19 in UK wildlife. So with that, um, any further ado, I will pass over to you, Rachel, if you'd like to share your screen. Excellent. So I'll get up, hopefully, the correct talk here on this one. Can you guys see that? Is it coming up? Um, yet? Let me zoom oh, yep, here it is. Yep. Cool. So that should be there now. Yes, it is. My computer is, of course, been slow. So, uh, so what I'm what I'm going to talk to you about is work we've been doing over the last uh, year or so, looking at coronaviruses in wildlife, which has obviously been a very topical issue. Um, so I'm assuming most of you are not virologists. So um, this is just a couple of slides on basic bits that are helpful to understand some of the later things to do with how the virus spreads between animals. So bear with me for a bit. So um, coronaviruses are enveloped RNA viruses. What that means in practical terms is they've got a lipid membrane around them and it means they're relatively fragile in the environment. So they don't last uh, very long outside of their hosts. So once they've dried out, they die very quickly. And this is um, minutes, um, maximum hours in kind of fridge-like conditions. But generally they're quite fragile and they, they don't last very long in the environment. So they're not an organism that spreads by fomites or, or that sits about in the environment. They generally spread from person to person or animal to animal. For RNA viruses, they're quite big. They have really a lot of genes, a lot more than some of the other viruses we study. Um, but I've just listed here a couple of the important ones for some of the testing um, things we do with them. So you probably heard about these in the media, the vaccines and things anyway, and the tests. So the spike protein is the surface protein. These are um, artist representations that have been developed uh, in collaboration with uh, Ed Hutchinson's at uh, the CVR in Glasgow. And these are actually, well, not the colors, but these are actually really what it looks like, these kind of little fluffy pom-pom things. So the spike proteins on the surface, and this is the protein that actually binds to the cell receptor. In uh, the case of SARS-2, this is uh, ACE2. Um, and it's important for actually getting into the new cell. The other important bit about it is because it sticks out on the surface. This is the bit the immune system sees. It means it's also the bit that varies the most because it's under the most pressure from the immune system trying to kill it and control it. So it tends to be the most variable region. It's also the bit that uh, almost all of the vaccines are directed against. So the one of the other surface proteins is the envelope, which is uh, here on the surface um, and it, it functions to help package up the virus. It is however a very small gene and it's not very variable between viruses because it's not sticking out like the spike and it's kind of a bit hidden there. So the other one that's important in diagnostics is the RDRP 
which is the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. It's um, packed in the middle here and it's actually not uh, in the virion, it's not actually produced. It's only produced when it infects cells. And this one's really important because it's the, the gene that the virus uses to actually copy its genome. So it absolutely needs this to complete its life cycle and make new copies of itself. Um, what that means is that this tends to be the least variable part of the virus. And that is this uh, region is the one we look at when we're trying to pick up as many different coronaviruses as we can. So that's just general potted coronavirus virology. So moving on to types of coronaviruses, there are an awful lot of coronaviruses. Um, we would expect if we go and test the species that we will find a coronavirus, um, probably multiple ones. There are at least five in humans along with SARS. Um, so we have and species that we do a lot of testing of and looking in, we usually find more than one. Dogs have got at least three. So usually in veterinary medicine, we think of them as causing either gastrointestinal or respiratory disease, and they tend to display a tropism for one or the other. So they tend to either be a gastrointestinal virus or a respiratory one. They can, some will do both, but they tend to display a tropism for one or the other. So this phylogenetic tree over here uh, in the corner is uh, most of the, it doesn't have all the, two and a half million or whatever SARS sequences in it. But these are most of the mammalian, most of the mammalian and, and uh, avian coronaviruses that are known. And they're split roughly into four genera. So the alpha, beta, gamma and delta. So for the purposes of this talk, we're not gonna talk very much about gamma and delta coronaviruses because uh, they're predominantly found in birds and they're generally thought of as, as avian viruses. There's a couple of um, exceptions to that. So um, there's been a recent uh, spillover of Delta into pigs that's caused quite large uh, problems in production pigs. So that's some children shouting in the background. Uh, and bizarrely, uh, a gamma coronavirus in beluga whales, but no one knows what's going on there. So that kind of just the general kind of overview of coronaviruses. The ones that infect mammals generally belong to the alpha and beta coronavirus groups and that's they're the ones we're going to be talking about further or that we worry about in mammals. So most apologies for the shouting children. So most species carry multiple viruses, like I've said before, humans have got five, dogs have uh, oh, three we know about now. So, uh, however, we, we don't test or look a lot for, for viruses outside of our, our domestic species. There's been quite a bit of work in the past looking at rodents and bats because they tend to be vectors for a lot of zoonotic disease. So there's been a bit more work done in those. But for a lot of our mammalian species, we don't actually have a clue what pathogens or potential viruses they are carrying. Hence that tree is much smaller than our mammalian tree because we just don't look at it. So the ones we do worry about, however, are the ones where we've had recent spillovers into the human population. So we've had quite a few in recent years. So, and the, most of these have, are thought to have originally risen in bats. So we have uh, MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Virus, which historically has gone from bats to camels. It's primarily thought of as a camel virus now, and people tend to contract it from infected camels. And that's been uh, kicking along at a low rate in the Middle East, so occasional spillers elsewhere for quite some time, 20, probably 10, 15 years now. Um, we had SARS-1, uh, nearly 20 years ago now, uh, and that went from bats into small carnivores, um, particularly civets in Southeast Asia, and then on into the human population. And obviously, we've uh, only we're only just coming out of the SARS-2 pandemic. We we don't actually know what the intermediate species there was. There's some speculation it might have been pangolins. It may have been small carnivores. Uh, most virologists are fairly settled that that market in Wuhan had a wide range of species in it and that's the site in which it, it really took off into the human population. But we don't actually know if they cleared it very quickly 
um, what animals were in there. We may never know what the, the actual intermediate species was. So that's obviously focused a lot of attention on, on wildlife coronaviruses for this potential spillover into humans and the very devastating pandemic we've recently had. So there's an awful lot of attention on coronaviruses in bats. And it might seem like bats are the plague vectors. However, it's important to remember there are a lot of species of bats and therefore a lot of species of coronaviruses. There's estimated over 4,000 species of bats worldwide. It's a massive genre. So this map over here I've stolen from, uh, it's not mine, it's from this publication, Wong et al. So this map uh, shows you these the uh, horseshoe bats species range where horseshoe bats are present and, we, and those species are the ones that have the SARS-like viruses in them, the sub -ecoviruses. And you can see there's an awful lot of horseshoe bats and an awful lot of sub -ecoviruses, um spread over a huge range. So bats have both alpha and beta coronaviruses. Uh, it is primarily beta coronaviruses that have resulted in spillovers in people, SARS and MERS. The beta coronaviruses themselves are split into SARS-BKoviruses, the SARS-like ones, MERS-BKoviruses, the MERS-BKovirus ones, and you also have NORS-BKoviruses, MBKoviruses, and HIBKoviruses. They tend to be quite species, um, the viruses tend to be reasonably species specific in their natural hosts. If we're talking about SARS, um, we're talking about sub -ecoviruses. and sub -ecoviruses are pretty much horseshoe bat viruses. So, so the thought of their natural host is horseshoe bats. Most horseshoe bat species that we've tested have a sub virus in them. Um, we have sub viruses in Europe alongside our horseshoe bats. The ones we have in Europe are not thought to have uh, the furin cleavage site, which is a particular region of genetic change in the, the spike gene that is thought to convey infectivity to humans. So we don't think the ones we have in Europe are infective to humans, but there's a lot of assumptions in that statement um, that may or may not be true. So, so really we've got an awful lot of different viruses and species here. So in terms of the SARS-2 pandemic, um, what we've then gone on to, to see is because of the massive size of the human pandemic and the numbers of people that have been infected, uh, that's produced a huge spillover pressure from people back into the animal population. So this list is not up to date and it keeps uh, growing every time I look. So we have good strong field evidence for outbreaks of SARS-2 initially driven from people in cats, dogs, American mink, white-tailed deer, a large variety of zoo felids, uh, great apes, uh, we need to add hamsters to that list and I'll talk about them in a minute. Um, we've got lab evidence in a wide variety of, of other species, some of which overlap with the ones we're seeing field outbreaks in, some of which don't. So uh, the list of lab animals includes you know, ferrets, hamsters, deer mice, a small variety of primates, Egyptian fruit bats, rabbits, skunk. I don't know why people were testing some of these animals, but they were um, bushy-tailed wood rats, raccoon dogs, and that list is similarly continuing to growing. I'm going to talk a bit later about house mice infections because there's a bit of a query mark over that. So we didn't, the earlier strains of coronavirus, the original ones, couldn't infect house mice. Uh, however, some of the later strains, at least in lab infections, can. Fortunately, um, we have another project in India where we have been looking at wild macaques. We've not seen any evidence of infection in wild primates to date, um, which is probably a good thing given the problems uh, feral macaques cause in Southeast Asia, but we'll get to that in a minute. So I'm going to talk a bit about the species that in terms of, you know, veterinary in terms of animal human interactions that we're really concerned about or we've had larger scale problems. So probably the, the biggest one is cats, domestic cats. So they can be readily infected in lab experiments and they readily spread it to each other. Um, there are lots of reports of domestic cats contracting it from their owners. There have been some very recent reports of owners contracting it from their cats. Um, that probably happens at a greater rate than is reported, um, but it's actually quite difficult to demonstrate because the numbers of humans infections 
and most places, including the UK, have made it quite difficult in terms of the legislative environment to test cats. And that was originally done to you know, preserve capacity for testing in the human population. Uh, but there's also, there's also a bit of an issue with, with many government veterinary jurisdictions of, of not really wanting to know um, that there's a problem that they may have to deal with. So um, that's to be taken with a bit of a caveat, but it certainly occurs. In the UK, um, cat testing is being done by Margaret Hosey at the University of Glasgow as part of a research project, because we're not allowed to test them clinically. Um, and she's been doing quite a lot of work to date. It keeps going up, but about 5% of cats in the UK are seropositive. So that's 5% of the domestic cats in the country that have had SARS-2 at some stage or another. Does it cause disease in cats? We don't actually really know. There are some reports from vets of respiratory and cardiac problems in cats that are positive for SARS-2, um, but because the testing is restricted, it's been quite difficult to figure that out. Quite a lot of vets suspect so, but uh, we don't can't, can't really say anything definitive there at the moment. Is it spreading between cats? Not as far as we could tell, but it is quite hard to tell because we're not testing a lot of cats. Uh, and most of the big uh, kind of sh uh, shelter sites that hold lots of cats are, are, are not willing to let us test um, because they, there was quite a bit of worry at the start of the pandemic in particular that we'd make them put all the cats down. So, um, and that, that drives a reluctance to, to know the answer or to test. And like I said, we've had lots of sporadic cases in zoo and wild felons. So felidae cats uh, seem to be quite prone to, to picking up SARS-2. Just a note on dogs, dogs can be infected, but the virus doesn't replicate well in them and they don't produce a high enough viral teeter to, to spread it on effectively. So while dogs can be infected, um, they don't, they, they can't really spread it on to, to each other or to, to their owners, which is probably a good thing. So mink, obviously there's been a huge amount of publicity and interest in, in mink. Uh, we had mass outbreaks in farmed mink. It was first reported in the Netherlands. Their veterinary services are very, very good and they have very good links with their producers. And the reason they, they started testing was because of a respiratory disease outbreak in a mink farm that triggered testing. And it, it spread like absolute wildfire in these mink farms. Some of the farms had 100% of the animals and there were often you know hundreds up to thousands of animals in these sites um and some of them all of them tested positive within a couple of weeks in some cases and there were some documented cases of transmission from the mink back to the people caring for them on the farms uh particularly in the netherlands and denmark this triggered a, a mass cull of these farms for human safety reasons in some cases in the Netherlands, for instance, they were in the, in the process of phasing out fur farming. This was completed in the UK in 2006. So in essence, they brought that program forward and culled out all of the farms. Um, however, there, there's a lot of places that farm mink and there's quite large farms in the USA and China. Um, pretty much everywhere that farms mink has, well, the places that report outbreaks, Russia hasn't reported any, but Oh, we don't see any reason why they wouldn't have the same issue, um, has seen this phenomena. Interestingly, there's been no reports in wild mink, um, and the USDA and the guys in the Netherlands in particular have been quite proactive in trapping animals uh, in and around the mink farms. They picked up one animal that, they, that was an escapee from a farm that tested positive in the US. But we've really not seen it uh, spreading in wild mink. And the, the, th the thinking behind why we're seeing such a difference between the farmed and the wild mink is in, in, the, in the wild, their natural behaviour is they are a very solitary species. So their behaviour really means there's a limited opportunity for it to spread amongst them. So we've got a really big contrast between the situation in our farmed animals, which are kept at high density, and our wild animals where we're not seeing it spreading at all. Um, ferrets are obviously reasonably closely related to, to mink. 
Um, they are just as susceptible as mink and cats, but because they're not as widely kept, there hasn't been as much testing or follow up of them. They are commonly uh, co very common and very susceptible uh, lab model as well. So we would expect to see the same situation in ferrets that we do in cats and mink. It's just that there aren't so many of them, so they're not test not been tested so intensively. So deer, so this, this is probably the situation that's caused the most consternation um, and will cause us the biggest problems going forward. So this is my colleague, Suresh Kuchapudi, who used to work at Nottingham. He now works at Penn State in the US as a media photo set up for the New York Times, but it demonstrates the point quite nicely. So they've had a, really a very large outbreak of SARS-2 in white-tailed deer in the USA. And in some regions, between 20 and 40% of the white-tailed deer are positive. They've got multiple reports in multiple locations, both active virus detection, qPCR virus isolation, and serology reports. So it's a lot of people doubted this at the start, but it is very real and very large. Um, white-tailed deer readily spread it to each other in experimental conditions and in terms of their ecology they're very very common species in the U.S. and they're very high densities in urban and peri-urban areas. Lots of people will have a, not quite a pet but an animal that comes into their backyard that they feed and they interact with so there's there's an awful lot of human interaction between between people and deers. This is on top of the the popularity of of hunting as a as a sport in the U.S. and in some places, um, white-tailed deer are the most commonly hunted species. Some of these populations are managed to maximise numbers for hunting. They often provide feed dumps for them. They'll put out urine laws, so they are actively managed to keep the numbers very high for hunting. We've got a completely different situation in Europe, and this has um, got us all scratching our heads at the moment. There's been quite a group, few groups looking. So my colleague Alex Greenwood at the Leibniz in Berlin and uh, the UK Health and Safety Agency here in the UK, and they've surveyed thousands of animals really, because they're already surveying for other diseases um, in deer. Uh, and they've we've not detected it at all. No one's detected it in Europe, and there has been quite quite intensive, quite an amount, quite a little bit of looking. This is not because we're not looking. Um, so we don't really know why we've got such a difference between what's happening in the US and what's happening here. We just know it is different. We do have a very different species range to the US, very different population density and a very different management regime. Um, it, it is possible that the species we have are not able to be infected as readily as the white-tailed deer. Looking at what we do know about the molecular biology of the virus and its transmission, our deer should be susceptible, um, but we're not seeing that this transmission that we're seeing into the white-tailed deer in the US. And I think most people are probably leaning towards a, a behavioral ecology explanation in terms of the population density and the interaction with people. But this is certainly a situation to watch going forward, but that's the situation we've got now. Because we have such a large outbreak in, in deer, it has, um, they have good evidence now that it is spreading independently in the deer population, and it will most likely maintain itself in that population. As it starts to diverge from the human isolates, we then end up in a risk situation for the human population, where we might have a variant coming back from the deer into the human population that's quite different to the ones we've got. So that's going to require quite intensive monitoring going forward. And that's probably the situation we're most worried about in the veterinary virology world. Hamsters and other rodents. So Syrian hamsters, so croquetted rodents, including Syrian, Syrian hamsters are one of the most common lab models used for human disease. They tend to have mild disease, they readily spread it to each other, they're easy to keep in captivity. In the US, um, colleagues at Colorado have looked at deer mice, which are also croquetted rodents like hamsters, and they do spread it to each other in the lab. Uh, similar, However, similar to the situation in the mink, no one's picked it up in wild animals so far. The USDA have been looking, but have not found it so far. And like I said before, the initial strains, the Wuhan strain of the virus couldn't infect house mice or rats, even in the lab, to the point where they had to genetically modify 
mice to use those as a, as a human model or as a disease model. However, some of the more recent strains, including Omicron, are able to infect wild type, uh, or wild type as wild type as a lab mouse can be, uh, are able to infect mice in the, in the lab. Quite a lot of groups have been looking at wild house mice or brown rats, and so far we've not picked it up. Um, there's been a lot of speculation about some of the sequences found in some of the sewerage sequencing, that that might be a, a mouse or a rat strain. However, talking to the guys who are doing that monitoring here at Nottingham, it's more likely that those strains are human gastrointestinal strains and that the vast majority of the sequences and the sequencing database in the human population are respiratory samples because people are much happier to stick a swab up their nose than up their bottom. People don't like providing uh, fecal samples. Um, so, so that's that's kind of where we're at with that and we had quite recently or oh, probably about two months ago now there was an outbreak in pet shop hamsters in Hong Kong the reason they picked it up was it was uh, a completely different strain an older strain than the one that was currently circulating in Hong Kong so they they picked up the, a couple of people with this unusual strain and when they contact traced those people a number of them had been in or were all linked to a particular pet shop and hamsters in the pet shop. They tested the hamsters, the hamsters had COVID. Um, and the, the kind of bizarre back trail of this, which the media haven't picked up on, is that the, the hamsters actually originated at a very big breeding centre in the Netherlands. Um, I have no idea why this is commercially viable, but there is quite a trade in breeding up uh, small pocket pets like hamsters in large centres in, in Europe, in the Netherlands, and then shipping these to Hong Kong or Southeast Asia on planes to be sold as pets. So that breeding centre in the Netherlands was the source of this outbreak, and it would appear that this older strain of SARS-2 had been continually circulating in that hamster, in, and there, there were other small rodents there, but in the hamsters for quite some time before it was picked up in this outbreak in Hong Kong. This caused unexpected carnage in that the Chinese government attempted to enforce a hamster cull uh, and people you know, and still are hiding their hamsters and uh, trying to avoid the, the cull and you had all these weeping children having to hand over their, their, their pet hamster and, and it was a good example of how not to do public engagement with disease control um, and hamsters only have short-term infections and could have been quite easily quarantined. But anyhow, so that's hamsters and rodents. So we're doing a bit of a whistle-stop tour through things here. So this is the project we've been working on. So we uh, eventually gained UKRI funding to look at UK wildlife, um, primarily to, to see whether we have the situation we had in the, the US or not. And other people, the UK Health and Safety Agency, are doing the... Deer. So we chose, we had to focus somewhere. So at the time when the, the project was written, these were the groups of species that we felt were, were probably the greatest risk. So we focused on mustelids. And in the UK, that's otters, badgers, weasels, stoats, feral mink, pine marten and polecats. And we also decided to look at foxes because we know we've got this issue with uh, domestic dogs and cats and foxes are relatively closely related. Uh, we have two species of horseshoe bats in the UK, greater horseshoe and lesser horseshoe bats. So we looked at those and we looked at cricketed rodents. So water voles, field voles and bank voles are the three species of cricketed rodents we have in the UK. We could go endlessly with species to test, but we focused on these because they were the highest risk at the time. Um, and we had a target of 80 samples per species, which should have allowed us to detect about a 5% prevalence rate of virus. And we've done previous work uh, on, on rodents in the UK, and that's about the prevalence rate of the alpha coronavirus that we have in UK rodents. Um, so most of the samples were collected from 2021 onwards, though we did, we some of the must, rare and mustelid species we've struggled to access enough samples for, so we do have some historical samples in the collection. And the choice of which sample we had was largely dictated by what was available, 
because we were operating largely off the back of existing or other programs rather than actively trapping or sampling. And this also had to be done quite quickly. So setting up these types of programs takes a very long time. So utilizing existing ones is much better animal welfare and purely pragmatically to get this done as quickly as possible. So we did, did do some active uh, fecal sampling of small rodents, uh, um, particularly the, the voles. So this is uh, my PhD students and postdocs. So a lot of this work has been done by Tanangi Apar and Amy Withers, postdocs of the projects, Christabel, one of the PhD students, um, trapping uh, bank bowls on campus. That is a bank bowl, yes, in Longworth traps and just collecting the feces out of the bottom of the trap and then letting the bank bowls go. So that's what we've been doing with our small, small rodents. Uh, and we've stuck the samples in RNA later uh, and then got them to ship them down to us uh, through either by a courier or through the post uh, and then stuck them in the freezer till we were ready to extract them. For badgers and otters, um, we at Nottingham uh, have a DEFRA funded, Malcolm Bennett has a DEFRA funded tuberculosis monitoring project, the Southern Edge Survey project. So we have quite a large badger post-mortem program from roadkill badgers running through the vet school post-mortem labs. So we could access um, quite a different range of samples there. Similarly, the Cardiff Otter Project, which is a long, long running post-mortem project for roadkill otters, was one of our one of our co-applicants and participated. So we had um, had lung samples from badgers and otters from those projects. Do, 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 do. So mostly fecal samples and or swabs. For some species, we had access to post-mortem samples. Extracted RNA, made cDNA, and then used two different types of PCR. So one is a pan-coronavirus PCR for the RDRP gene. It will detect, it's the most commonly used assay for surveying for novel coronaviruses. It will detect most coronaviruses as far as we know. So that's quite a broad assay for detecting whatever's in there. It's not a terribly sensitive assay, but it will pick up a broad range of any sort of coronavirus. The other assay we used is a subecovirus specific assay. So it's a qPCR for the e-genes. It was developed for human diagnostics by one of the German groups. Um, it, it's very specific just for subecoviruses, but it is a much more sensitive assay. And um, we ran some reference genes dependent on the species for bats, cytochrome B, uh, for the mustelids, carnivores and rodents, beta actin, just to check that our samples were, were good enough to amplify uh, at least some sort of PCR. So results. So these are the results for the mustelids and you'll be pleased to know that most of them are negative. And uh, we had quite large numbers of some of these species, some species we've struggled to get samples for. We've had a few 10, 20 fox samples come in recently. So we'll have a few more results for foxes soon. Um, but most of them were negative, bar three stoats on the pan coronavirus PCR. So those stoats all came from Orkney, from the Native Wildlife Project, which is actually a stoat eradication program led by the RSPB. Stoats are not native to Orkney. They were first reported there in 2010 and their introduction uh, has a, a very destructive effect on, on native birds because they will eat uh, eggs and nest nestlings and, and can be very devastating for, for bird roosting sites. So they are attempting to eradicate them. So the, we only have, uh, the samples are away for deep sequencing at the moment. So, so far we only have a very small portion of the, the RDRP gene Sanger sequenced. And what, what the virus we've detected there is an alpha coronavirus and it's closely related to ferret and mink coronaviruses. And that's a group called the Mina coronavirus subgroup. So it's not SARS-2, which is probably a good thing. However, it is in this group of viruses are interesting for other reasons. 
So this group of alpha coronaviruses appears to be quite widespread in mustelids. So these are, this is not mine, this is from someone else, one of the American group's papers. These are the species that have been tested so far. So we know it causes disease in captive ferrets and mink. And you get, if you're a veterinarian, you get a fel an FIP, feline infectious peritonitis, which is a severe disease so you see in cats with coronaviruses. You also see that in, in some ferrets. So it definitely causes disease in these in in, cap, in captive animals. One of the more problematic or worrying things about this is when they've gone back to to those mink farms where they had SARS two in the mink and tested them for other coronaviruses they had. They've got this one as well. So they've got this mink alpha coronavirus, uh, and there's obviously some concern if you have infection with multiple coronaviruses that you may get recombination between the viruses. It's not happened to date, and it's rare to get recombination between alpha and beta coronaviruses, but it is possible. And it's put this kind of group of viruses and these group of animals kind of on a, on a watch list there. The other problem with this group of viruses is there's a number of canine isolates in this group that have been known are known to have swapped segments with related feline and pig porcine viruses uh, the pig version of these has caused really a very large outbreak of, of, of clinical disease in, in domestic pigs in production animals and it's been really a, quite a large problem it's also recently been reported in raccoon dogs. So this particular group of viruses is very prone to swapping bits with each other. <clears throat> and even more problematically, uh, there's also, because there's been such intensive monitoring of human respiratory disease, we've realized that we do see these viruses in humans. So there've been reports of, of these, particularly the canine viruses in cases in human children, in human pneumonia cases. So uh, these kind of cross species events and, and swapping events are, are probably much more common than we realize because we're studying this group of viruses so intensively at the moment, this kind of stuff is coming to light. So this group of, we're waiting for the rest of the sequence back before we know exactly what's going on with it. But this group of viruses are problematic for a number of reasons. So rodents, all of the rodents we've tested to date are negative. We haven't even found the alpha coronavirus that we know is present in some of them in the first place. Um, so we've, we're not seeing that we've, we've got in the Hong Kong hamsters in our wild rodents. And some of these, particularly the water voles, um, the groups doing various water vole monitoring of Fiona Matthews, who's one of the collaborators here, has, has really good connections with lots of groups doing water vole um, surveys and monitoring. Some of those water voles were collected from urban Glasgow at the height of the Delta wave. And we had things come back written on the sample pots and, and bags with things like found dead next to testing center. So if we were going to see a spillover, it should have been these animals and we weren't picking up anything at all. So I can't like never say never that we don't have infections, but we're not seeing things like the hamsters in Hong Kong or with the deer in the US. Um, and like I said, we've, we know we've got alpha coronaviruses in UK rodents uh, and we've not, not even picked that one up. Um, so that's rodents. Bats. So we did pick up a sub virus in lesser horseshoe bats. Interestingly, just in the lesser horseshoe bats, we've picked up nothing at all in the greater horseshoe bats. Uh, and some of the, the bat monitoring groups and Fiona, again, very enthusiastic about sending samples in. And we got really a lot, lot of samples, a lot more than our target. We also looked at a couple of other species. So, the, like I said, that qPCR will pick up all sub ecoviruses, not just SARS. And it doesn't look like, based on the secrets we've got at the moment, um, that it, it's not SARS. It is another sub virus. So we know that UK lesser horseshoe bats have the sub virus. So uh, one of the groups at East Anglia, this paper, Crook et al, uh, off the back of the SARS work, we're doing some testing and monitoring and pulled out a full sequence of it. And we think it's likely this virus that we've picked up, but the sequencing is 
at the sequencing centre at the moment. We may get it back this week. So we're waiting back for the full sequencing to double check what we've got. But it's most likely this one, same species. The little tiny segment we've got at the moment, it looks the same. Interesting, the pipistrels we tested were largely animals in care and the carers had contracted COVID. So the IUCN BAT guidelines recommend testing before release for in those circumstances. However, the APHA won't test them and there isn't a formal testing service readily available. So we tested a, a few that came in off the back of our, our horseshoe bat monitoring um, because we had the facility set up to do it and had research ethics permission to do it. Um, so reassuringly, none of those animals were positive and no one has reported sub viruses in, in wild bats aside from horseshoe bats and no one's reported SARS-2 in bats so it's probably lower risk but like we can we can't ever ever say never so that's bats so just to show you some of the data from the bats because we do have quite a lot of them positive so lesser horseshoe bats are not terribly common in the UK uh, so this uh this map over here is basically taken from JNCC. This is the distribution of lesser horseshoe bats in the UK. And you can see we've sampled across most of a bit more than the, the documented distribution site. And the roost sites, so we've got the red ones and the positive roost sites. The green ones are the ones we didn't detect it in. So it's quite widespread across different roost sites. Um, lots of the samples were just droppings taken from roost sites, not necessarily individual animals. So I can't tell you how many individuals were infected, but I can tell you how many roost sites we picked it up in. So it's quite widespread across uh, lesser horseshoe bass routes in the UK. Um, and we've sampled quite a proportion of them. So there's only about 17,000 individuals in the UK, 170 maternity roosts and 300 hibernation sites. We've sampled quite a chunk of them. Uh, and this is what we're, we're saying so far. <clears throat> so that's, I don't have any more information on it than, than that at the moment, because um, this is as much as we've got. We've still got a few samples to test, so this will change a little bit, but I'm not expecting it to look drastically different by the time we finish and take it to publication. <clears throat> so we're pretty much, talk's pretty much finished. So we've obviously got lots of work <laughs> to do still. Um, so we're, we're sequencing is away at the moment and we're waiting to try and get sequencing back to, to finish off the what's going on with the viruses. And obviously there's a whole pile of follow on work that has to happen here. We, we don't have a clue about the ecology of the viruses in, in the hosts, even in Southeast Asia where they've been monitoring for years. Um, our knowledge of the ecology of the viruses in the natural hosts is really poor. So really basic stuff like prevalence, seasonal pattern, which roost sites is it maternal versus hibernation. This is stuff we've not got a clue about and need to. All we've done is a single point prevalence survey at the moment. We have no idea whether it causes disease in the animals themselves, whether it impacts them on in any way or what its host range is between here and Europe. The other problem we've got at the moment is as the SARS, as SARS continues to evolve in humans, its host range, the potential range of animal species it can affect will keep changing. So like we've seen with the lab mice with the strains where they weren't able to be infected with the earlier strains, but some of the more recent ones they are, and that could go back the other way again, that uh, potential host range in animals it won't stay stable, it will keep changing. And those of us who work in this area, you know, we we really need to, to keep monitoring because we can't say that what we have now is what we're gonna have in five or 10 years time. We do not know enough and to, to say, yes, it's fine. We don't need to bother with the animals anymore um, because we don't know that. And the situation with the white-tailed deer in the US is, that, that could still occur. We're not seeing it right now in Europe, but we don't know what's going to happen going forward as it continues to evolve in people. So last couple of slides. So given this talk to a couple of different like ecology or, or to 
wildlife care groups and, and the thing they want to know is how to stop their animals getting infected and this um this uh, slide over here is from the IUCN so they developed it these these recommendations in conjunction with colleagues at Imperial and to be honest this is you know reasonably reasonably sensible for the sorts of things you need to do it is quite hard to completely stop people interacting with animals particularly things like cats and deer is very hard to prevent the general public from interacting with them um, for your higher risk or your rare species or where you're doing actively going into monitor to roost sites and caves you really should be considering your, your biosecurity protocols in general, regardless of, of SARS or not. And they do this for some higher risk species, for instance, the gorillas in Miranda, where anyone who goes into those sites has to wear gloves, has to wear FFP3 face masks, um, you know, even the simple things, change your gloves, change your boots, uh, shower and change your clothes between sites. If you look at the white nose fungus in the US, that is primarily spread by cavers and, and researchers going from one site to another. And the recommendations for stopping spreading that are, are really, you know, change, disinfect and change your gear and change your boots in between sites. And I think people don't fully think this through enough with the impact of diseases they might be transmitting between sites on, on their gear and themselves. I mean, if you are going to wear masks, they do need to be FFP3 face masks. Your surgical masks or your cloth face coverings are just not going to cut the mustard in terms of actually preventing transmission reliably. So you do need to wear the, the, the expensive proper masks and they are single use. You can't reuse them. So at present, while testing, lateral flow tests, etc., is still available, it would be prudent to test yourself before going into these sites. Um, how long that facility will be available for, who knows? The government certainly isn't going to want to continue paying for it at that scale. So in the longer term, can we stop spillover from the human population into the wild animal population altogether? Probably not. Just the number of human cases and the continuing number of human cases is just going to be too high. We are not going to, we're not going to stop it altogether. And it's unrealistic to think we would to stop everyone patting their backyard hedgehog and, and kissing their cat or patting their deer. Um, like I said, will different species potentially be susceptible to different variants? Yes, but we can't actually predict that with any certainty, which way that will go, which species, what direction the virus will go. We don't have a good handle on how the virus is going to mutate despite the huge amount of work. That's actually really, really difficult to do. Um, it's easy to, easy to document after the fact. It's quite hard to predict. Um, animal vaccination, it's very possible. It, SARS-2, fortunately, was a, a disease that was readily vaccinatable and is and we'll be looking going forward to update the human strains seasonally like we do with influenza and they've started um, probably those will begin to be available in the autumn updated human strains so it is very possible to vaccinate animals however at the height of the human pandemic and given that huge numbers of the human population have not been vaccinated yet in developed countries it really wasn't terribly ethical to be advocating vaccinating cats ahead of Head of children. However, Zoetis, one of the major vaccine manufacturers in the veterinary world, have, have developed, developed one. They're primarily looking at, at, market, at, at a dog and cat market. They can't make vaccines for free. They go out of business if they do. Um, so there has to be a viable commercial market for them to, to go through the registration process and produce it. The other, whatever you think of farmed mink or not, the other primary market for this vaccine is farmed mink. Uh, and in Russia, they, they have one in use. How good it is, nobody knows, because um, they've not released it for testing elsewhere. So Zoetis, to give them credit, uh, and, and they, they're not an evil pharmaceutical company, the people who work it do really care about what they're doing. They have donated the vaccine for emergency use for use in zoos. It's not licensed yet, but if you work in a zoo or, or with vulnerable or critically endangered species, you can go and ask Zoetis and they'll give you the vaccine for free. 
Uh, so, and to vaccinate your animals and a large number of zoo primates uh, and the black-footed ferret recovery program in the US have taken up that offer and used that vaccine. It's a very simple vaccine. It's an adjuvanted spike protein. As far as vaccine technology goes, it's very simple, but it works fine. Um, and they have been quite generous there. In terms of wild populations, vaccinating wild animals is really difficult. Um, developing oral vaccines is really difficult. The only really successful example of that's been the rabies vaccine. And that was driven off a, of a human health concern. And it took, it took quite a long time to get that to work reliably. So at present, the way the SARS vaccine is, you really would have to catch them and inject them, um, which is feasible if you've got animals in care and are releasing them. But actually getting to a, a level where your vaccine level is going to make a difference in your wild population if you've got to catch them and inject them is really, really difficult. And it's one of the reasons why vaccinating wild animal populations is, is not usually a viable disease prevention strategy. For some very rare species with small numbers, they do do it. Um, but for larger populations, it's generally considered just not very feasible, particularly not if you don't have a registered vaccine that you can buy. Um, so that's where we're at with that and that's pretty much it so there have been a huge number of people involved in this from a large number of institutes and an even larger number of people sending us in samples we also have a companion project in india looking at horseshoe bats uh, and small carnivores and macaques there but we so far haven't detected detected uh, any subic of ours at all in that project so that's it. So happy to answer any questions to the best of my ability. Or if you want to ask about other infectious diseases, I'll do my best. We've got research programs on quite a large number of things. I can at least direct you to the, pers to the right person. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rachel. That was such an amazing and comprehensive um, coverage. I, I learned so much from it. Um, we might have time for a couple of questions if um, anybody would like to um, turn on their video and raise their hand or put any questions in the chat. Um, we've got a few minutes left before the end. Stunned everyone and wrap it on. <laughs> Maybe while we're waiting for people to ask their questions oh here we go oh <laughs> that was fascinating thanks Rachel um Rachel I was wondering in the um species that do um sh do become diseased are they dying not in large enough numbers for us to notice right so in general the infections in animals have, in the experimental infections have all been mild um so we don't have a in any species so there, there's some suspicion that some of the cats are developing severe disease because we the numbers we've been able to test are, are low we haven't been able to pin that down properly um but it's certainly not and the white-tailed deer it doesn't seem to be making much difference to them no one's reporting obvious clinical signs even certainly not large numbers of dead animals mm. and the mink uh mink very mild disease the the reason they were cold wasn't because they were sick it was because of the human health risk hmm. um can i ask you what the symptoms are in the gorillas uh so mild respiratory symptoms so off their food uh mild fever runny nose cough very similar to what you see in, in people with mild infections hmm. And there, there've been a very small number of animals in zoos, but because they're such a, because they're such a endangered and charismatic species, and and they, they like, great apes are very because they're so closely related to us, they're very high risk for contracting human pathogens in the first place. So they monitor and keep a close eye on, on them for that reason in the first place. Um. Uh, Debbie is asking, thanks for the advice. samples we're still looking for, oh. yes. Mm. Yeah, so there, there's particularly um, 
for the smaller mustelids. So for so for foxes, we've we've had not a lot of samples of foxes coming in. I think some of the hunting groups have been a bit wary of this. So uh, fox samples we could really do with, and uh, some of so um, weasel stoats and and uh, any pine cats, pine marten. We, we could do with more samples of those. We're not going to come close to hitting our targets for those. I know they're quite hard to get hold of as part of the problem because they're not commonly trapped. We can we can take either post-mortem samples or swabs or faecal samples. The faecal samples would need to be relatively fresh. The stuff that's two or three days old, we're probably not going to pick much up in, but um, fresh scat we can, we can take and test. And I've got... I've got, I've got protocols and we can send out testing kits if anyone's got anything or if you've got stuff in freezers from Lord knows when um, we can we'll happily post-mortem it for you and, and can and get maybe you should stop sharing your screen Rachel oh so yeah I should do see that. you again <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we're all, we're almost coming up to seven o'clock, and we we like to try and finish on time. Did anyone have any last minute questions? That's fine. You can always drop me a line at my uni email if there's anything you want or any any inf any infectious diseases questions. I'm happy to. <laughs> if I don't know the answer, I can hopefully point to the right person. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your presentation tonight, Rachel. It was really, really interesting. And I, I didn't was... know that there was that much research going on on such a huge range of, of species. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. Fantastic to see and really, really interesting. And, um, you know, I guess it's a bit of a watch this space and see what comes next. Yeah, we don't know something. Yeah, the, the deer thing kind of everyone was like oh shit <laughs> <laughs> so Suresh has been in the eye of the storm really. so yes Rachel has just put her um, email in the chat if anybody wants to um, note that down and, and get in contact with her with any other questions so thank you again Rachel and that's um, all right my Thank pleasure. you to everyone yeah, for joining. Uh, we have one more um, meeting for this cycle, um, which is next month, which you can um, look at the CIM events page, and that is on the Kalani Fern and um, going about surveying for that. So um, we hope to see you all again very soon. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> Thanks very much, Rachel. That's fine, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.